What is going on, everyone? Welcome back to the RBI Podcast. My name is Richie. I am your host. And uh, we got a lot cooking. Uh, the hot stove is cooking, no pun intended. Um, we got a lot going on. I'm just going to get right into it. But before we do get into it, just always, you know, follow us on TikTok, Instagram, subscribe to us on YouTube, leave a review on Apple and Spotify. And yeah, just like you know what to do. Every Wednesday, this comes out 7 a.m. It drops, but it's available at any time you want. This isn't a live stream podcast. You you should know that by now. If you are a longtime listener for the three podcasts we've done so far, but I'm going to quit rambling and just we're going to get right into it because we got a lot to talk about today. And I'm recording this at 2.15 on Tuesday. I'm hoping I have to come back to this because we got more moves later. But for now, I'm just going to go with the three massive moves we got. And, you know, some some other thoughts I had on some things that are brewing around. Uh, speaking of brewing, the Brewers, they made a move. Uh, we'll talk about that later. But let's just get started. We're going to highlight this off with, of course, Jacob DeGrom. Um, I'm a Mets fan, so this hurt a lot. <clears throat> Excuse me. And, you know, he got five years, $185 million from the Rangers. I was in a restaurant and I'm, I saw Jacob, to, I saw breaking news from Jeff Passan and that it's always a f- fun or not fun site. And for this case, it was not a fun site for me. Um, I saw Jacob the and then I saw Texas Rangers. I'm like, damn, like I know I predicted uh, him to go back to the Mets. And if, if you guys follow me on TikTok, you saw the, the clown TikTok I made because I was over three so far with my picks. And, you know, it's just, the years is what got it there, but I think it's so much more than that. So contract details before we get into anything else. He got five years, $185 million. That's under $40 million a year, which is nuts because he's probably the best pitcher. And he is the best pitcher in baseball when healthy. Probably the best pitcher in the last 20 years. If you ask me, I would think so. They they literally they have stats like obviously Sabre metrics and analytics that show like his like he like doubles like in like whiff rate and K to walk ratio over everyone else. Like there was a stat yesterday. I forget what it was, but his was like 13.6. I don't know if it was like K K to walk percentage or, or whatever the stat was exactly. The next closest was like 6% or six. So it's like, it's more than double. Nonetheless, he's the most dominant pitcher of our generation, but at the same time, there is that risk. But I talk about a couple of weeks ago, how, if you're the Rangers, I love I, I like as a non-biased baseball fan, I love this move for the Rangers. Go for it. And I, I said it last time. I hate when people are like, they're not a good team. Why are they doing this? The only way you can get good good teams is by getting good players. And obviously Jacob DeGrom's a good player. It also takes pressure off of Martin Perez from being the ace. I know they got Jacob to Rizzi. I'm not the biggest fan of him, but he's a, a starter in the in major leagues. Um, like lighters coming up soon. Like he's your anchor now. He's your guy, and he's the guy. Do I think they compete with the Astros? No. Do I think they're better than the Mariners? Possibly, just because I don't love what the Mariners are doing right now. But nonetheless, more on the ground, I would say is from a Mets fan standpoint, and just from the Mets point of view. What we talk, we're going to talk about how they pivoted a couple of days later, but. If you read these reports from ESPN and I think Buster only came out with something, he didn't, he was never coming back to the Mets unless they gave him an absurd amount of money. And it's, it's a shame because like he was here nine years. He's probably, in my opinion, the second best pitcher in our, I say our, the the Mets franchise history behind Seaver. And he had a shot to be number one if he wanted to stay. But I spoke about like the comfortability and it seemed like he wasn't comfortable in New York anymore or ever was. I talked about with my friend a couple of days ago that when he first burst onto the scene and the Mets were good in 15, he wasn't the guy. Like he wasn't the alpha. It was Matt Harvey. And DeGrom was just like a stud pitcher. Like he 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 had no alpha or any extracurricular things going on around him. Last couple of years. He's been that guy. He's been the the Grom day. He's been the the larger than life guy for the Mets. And now they were good. So there's pressure added pressure to that. And I don't think he loved not saying he doesn't like pressure, but I, I don't think he loved the spotlight. 
the media jumping down his throat, all this stuff that goes on. And he's a South a Southern guy. So like he's that culture, that New York culture, he's not used to. And especially when you get to that point, when you are the guy and then you get Scherzer and you get Lindor and Pete Alonso comes up and you become good and, and pressure comes with privilege. And the, he had the privilege of being the best pitcher in baseball for five years. And I still think he is. Um, like there was, there was things that he like, he shut out like teammates, but like, like he wasn't a bad teammate, but he was just very private. He like he almost like he distanced himself from, and he never really grew uh, a true relationship with Steve Cohen, and that was probably the deciding factor because there was also things that he didn't. Uh, he told the, to, how do I put this? He he told the his agents not to contact the Mets that, like for a final offer, and you know what? Like Mets fans, you can hate him, love him, whatever you want to do, but. It's his choice. He just he he he. I saw people say like David Rice, the true leader. He took a pay cut for us, which he did. I'm not. This has nothing to do with David Wright, but it's just the uh, connection they made. Jacob Degrom took a pay cut for us a couple years ago. The first contract he signed was a pay cut, and because there's no shot that Wilpons are giving him forty million, and people forget about that. Like David Wright never got that second big contract because of injuries, unfortunately. DeGrom's able to get it, even with injuries, just because of like how super talented he is. And when he's on the field, you see it. And I just, as a Mets fan, I wouldn't be sour on this. Like, like I'm sour that he left, but like I'm, I'm not sour at him. I don't think he's a traitor. I don't think he, like, yeah, he chased money. The Rangers aren't going to stink. Do I think they're going to be good next year? I don't think so. But this is a five-year deal. Maybe two years, like these guys come up. Like Josh Young, Jack Leiter, they have some big time prospects coming up. Jonah Heim, Nathaniel Lowe is like probably the most underrated hitter in baseball, and you build that way. Their division's tough, but like I said, now you have an ace. They haven't had an ace in I don't even know how long. You Darvish maybe, I, and yeah, I just think that this is a great move for the Rangers. Like from their standpoint, you get that ace that so many teams don't have. Um, and now you can compete with the Mariners, at least for the second spot. I don't know about the Astros, even with the departure of Verlander, which we're going to get into next, but great move for the, the Rangers. But as a Met fan, d- don't be sour about this. It is what it is. I'm upset just because of like, he could, what, what, he could have been a legend, a Met legend, but you know, it is what it is. Um, from a business standpoint, I got, it, I get it. I didn't think they were going to go five years, let alone six. Cause I'm pretty sure he has an option on his deal. I think that the most the Mets offered was three years and like the Braves wouldn't go to 40 million, but I'm pretty sure he would have taken three years from the Braves because it's, it, it's, it's his hometown favorite team. But, you know, like I keep saying, it is what it is. It's over with now, but he's going through a lot of big things there. I don't, people are going to I hate people saying like, Oh, wait till he gets hurt. Like, no, I'm not wishing injury on anyone, especially a guy that did so much for the Mets including taking a pay cut. And I know people still say it's a lot of money, which it is. And I will always back that. Like it's crazy how many, how much athletes are making, but that's like the revenue. And we all, we all know how, why this works the way it is. And, you know, you're bringing in so much money, so they deserve to get that money. That's the way I look at it. Um, And if you don't agree with me, that's fine. I get it. But yeah, just my final thoughts, Jacob DeGrom, best pitcher in baseball now in the American league. Thank God, out of the National League, uh, he's going to do big things there, and I think it's just a start for the Rangers. I re- I wouldn't be shocked if they w- went out and got Rodon or some big time bats just to fill out their roster because they they got some guys. I I will say that they do have some guys. So good on the Rangers. Uh, luckily for Mets fans, uh, the pain for Degrom was gone in three days because we signed Justin Verlander. I keep saying we I. I, you know, I don't even apologize for it. I'm a, I'm a Mets fan through and through. I'm a diehard Mets fan. I, I'm a part of the Mets, in my opinion. But Justin Verlander signed with the Mets. Um, I think Steve Cohen, Billy Epler, I believe they they knew they didn't really have a shot at DeGrom, but they were going to give their best effort, see if like they can turn the tide. And they knew as soon as that he went away, they were going to turn their attention to Verlander. Verlander got two years, $86 million. With a vesting option of thirty-five million, 
What basically that means is it's an incentivized option because if he throws 140 innings in his second year of his contract, he has a player option for 2025. Um, I see people saying like this is a, like risky and why do this? And I, I don't think a two-year deal can be risky. You know, like even if he gets hurt, you, you're only tied to him for two years. You know, like it's not a eight-year deal where like you're, you, like like the Jacoby Ellsbury contract or like Josh Hamilton or even Albert Pujols for the Angels. It's a two-year deal. If he's good this year and hurt next year, then it, it's it. The, the contract's up. Like, you know, and he's not like, like obviously no, you don't want him getting hurt. You want him to being dominant. But I don't think a two-year deal can be risky unless you're banking on everything on that guy. The Mets still have Scherzer. That's the saving grace of this team is that Max Scherzer is still there. Justin Verlander is now there. And like he like he just won Cy Young. I, I'm actually surprised he left the Astros. I'm pretty I'm surprised it was so like obvious he was leaving. I predicted him to go back there, but it, I, I'm not gonna complain. And I also think this is a good thing of Steve Cohen and Billy Epler not being emotional about Jacob deGrom. You have to pivot. It's like you can't worry about something that you can't get back. Like DeGrom's not coming back now for at least five years, which probably he's probably never coming back to the Mets. So you have to pivot. And I like what they did a short term deal for a lot of money. The Mets have a lot of money to spend. Steve Cohen's the richest owner in baseball by a large margin. And like I keep saying, you're not tied to him for more than two years. And it, and if you get a third year, that means he pitched, which is like the ultimate goal. If he doesn't pitch well, then it is what it is. But, I think this is one of the it's a it's a high risk because he is 40. He had Tommy John a couple years ago. But he just knock on wood, he just proved health last year. And now you don't even have to be the ace of this rotation. You know, like is Scherzer better than Fran Valdez? I think so, but I think it's closer than people think, like at this very moment. But that one two punch is, is is ridiculous for the Mets. And they needed to do it because outside of Scherzer, like Carlos Carrasco is not a two. Tyler Miguel is not a two. David Peterson is not a two. Jose Budo, Jojo Lucchese, Eliezer Hernandez, the list goes on and on. I'm definitely missing someone too. Like they're they're probably going to lose Bassett. They're probably going to lose Tyron Walker. So they needed to replace at least one of those guys, especially that they lost to Grom. So this is basically replacing the Grom. Like I keep saying, I don't think they're done. I don't think, I think they're going to get a mid-level starter. I saw they have reports on... I think it was Kodai Senga, and I don't think it's Andrew Heaney. Uh, I don't, I forget the second. Maybe Jameson Tyone. But from a Mets standpoint, this is just a really good job of pivoting off of an emotional departure. Because let's be honest, Jacob Degrom is in a, like he's the best Met that in my generation, you know. And from the Astros standpoint, it's just crazy how everyone is just like expecting them to be fine without him. And it's it's sad, but it's true because they they're so loaded. Obviously, losing the Cy Young Award winner is not easy to to re- reciprocate for or replicate. That's the right word I'm looking for, replicate. But I, they've done a good job, like I said in the past, of just like moving on. This will be, I think, less seamless just because of his impact in the clubhouse as well as pitching. And but they went out with a bang. They won. They he won Cy Young. They won the World Series. And you know, like. It's one of those no hard feelings things. Like he is 40. So that would be the only thing I would say is that he is 40 years old. But I keep saying it. It's a two year deal. It's not a six year deal. And the Mets are in a position where they are a win now team trying to build a winning culture without prospects ready to come up for pitching. Blade Tidwell, Calvin Ziegler, and Matthew Allen are probably the three most notable Mets pitching prospects. And none of them are remotely close. Like it it's at least a year maybe even like probably two years. So there you go. So we'll, we'll, we'll cross that bridge in two years for Verlander or maybe three, you know, we don't know, but overall, I think this is a really good sign for the Mets and a really good job of taking emotion out of Jacob deGrom's signing with the Rangers and moving quickly rather than letting the market play out and losing Rodon or Verlander or a top of the line starter to a rival team or just someone else in general. Unfortunately for Mets fans, we had about three hours of celebratory uh, time for Verlander because Trey Turner got a gigantic.
gigantic deal from the Phillies. And it's not even from a money standpoint because he got less than $30 million a year. But he got 11 years, $300 million to play shortstop for the Philadelphia Phillies or second. Like, that's down the road. But right now, like, what a phenomenal job by Dave Dombrowski. He signs Bryce Harper. No, he didn't sign Bryce Harper, but they have Bryce Harper. They have Real Muto. Dave Dombrowski comes in. They get Castellanos. They get Schwarber. They go to the World Series. They get Trey Turner. You know, their pitching is still good. This is a team that I know, like, they've been, like, a laughing stock for 10 years, 11 years, but this is a team I would not want to see, like, at all this year because you add Trey Turner into this lineup with, I mean, I know Harper's out, like, until I think at least June, but when he comes back, you have Harper, Schwarber in order. Harper, Schwarber, Real Mudo, um, Turner, obviously. Cassianos is probably going to bounce back. Brandon Marr seemed to revitalize himself. Bryson Stott's getting the, he's growing into himself. I, I'm forgetting somebody too, which is um, Alec Bohm's a solid player. Reese Hoskins is a staple in Philly. They just have like their team. It's top heavy, but their top is so deep. If that makes sense, like they don't have like their bench isn't really notable to me. Their their farm system isn't. The most notable, even their their back of the end starters aren't the greatest, but they have so much top end talent that it can balance out their team just by them. Like Harper, Turner, Real Muto. Are you serious? That's 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 arguably the best trio in baseball. And I think Trey Turner is the best shortstop in baseball all around. He's I think easily the best offensive hit uh shortstop. Defensively, he's probably closer to average than great, but and he can also run. With the, the new bases coming in, I saw Tom Berducci talking about this. I couldn't agree more. The bigger bases, the, the pickoff limit, he's going to steal a ton of bases. He said 60. I don't think he's going to steal 60 bases, but I could see 45, 50. And I think what's interesting is that people are saying, like, he's, he turned down $342 million from the Padres, which would have surpassed Francisco Lindor as the highest shortstop paid uh, contract in the league, league history. but. I don't think he turned it down because he wanted to be in Philly. I think he turned it down because he wanted to be on the East Coast. Like, for example, if if this was the Braves or, like, I, I predicted the Cubs or even the Mets if they didn't have Lindor, I think he would have taken the money. But I think this was the highest offer he got from an East Coast team, and he's been very adamant about that. So, you know, it, $300 million – I'll take the comfortability over the extra money, but that's, that's everyone's personal preference. Um, I saw something the Braves were in on him until uh, he wouldn't go more than 20 million a year, which is just the way the Braves work. I'm not going to knock the Braves, but at the same time, it's just crazy to me how they just get these players for dirt cheap contracts and buy out their arbitration. It's insane to me. Um, I, I like the effort from the Padres though. I do. Tatis, I think he profiles more as an outfielder. Like, I truly think his best position is right field or probably not center, but right field. He's got a good arm. He's a freak athlete. You know, like, you don't have to think as much about the throw when you're in right field because your margin for error is bigger. You, you don't have to hit a small target in a small time frame unless you're throwing someone out at the plate. You're known for him for covering the ball in the gap, checking fly balls on the warning track, coming in on balls, stuff like that. But not to get into like a defensive mode, but I think that would have been a good move. But now it says that they're out of the shortstop market. It was basically Turner or Bust, which is fine because they do have Tatis and they do have Kim Cronenworth. Um, Machado can even play short if you need him to, which they would never do at this point. But yeah, Trey Turner, I would bat him. I would keep Schwarber leadoff because like he's he's like a Cunha. Like I, Ronald Cunha, when they moved him to three and four, he didn't produce as much. It's weird. It's being a comfort thing, but Kyle Schwarber is not your prototypical lead off hitter, but at the same time, he is because in this day and age, average doesn't mean as much anymore. Kyle Schwarber doesn't have the worst eye. If anything, he's got an above average eye, and he hits bombs, and he does it a lot. So you know what? Live with it. Live with his 220 average. He's one of the guys that can have a 220, 215 average when you're hitting 40 some, a plus 40 plus bombs a year. And just getting the engine going. I would probably slide Trey Turner at about him second. 
or third. Right, like when the season starts, I'd probably bat him third because of Harper being out, and I'd put Real Muto two. Um, I don't know if I'd go Cassiano's four or Hoskins four, or if I would go Turner uh, two, Real Muto three, Hoskins four. But like I keep saying, like it, it doesn't matter. Like the lineup construction is kind of like not relevant because of just how good of a player Trey Turner is. And I do not want to see him for 11 years. I am so happy that they changed the rules. So every team plays everyone. So we play the Phillies less, but this team's going to be scary. And I, I appreciate teams that go for it. I appreciate teams that when they have that window bust it open even more, you know, don't sit back and get Jose Iglesias. I thought they were going to get Bogarts, but, Trey Turner is the better option. He was also heavily rumored there the entire offseason. So great on the Phillies. I hate that it's great for the Phillies, but I can't like I, I can't deny it. Like he's the best shortstop in baseball. The, the two best shortstops in baseball in the NL East, uh, Lindor and Turner. I probably go Turner one, Lindor two, but it is what it is. Some interesting news I saw um out of Pittsburgh, the Pirate Land, uh Brian Reynolds, he requested a trade. This, like, it just aggravates me how teams like the Pirates, the Royals, even though in 15 they won. Uh, Diamondbacks are a bad example. The Rockies, they just they can't get out of their own way, and they just can't figure it out. I don't, like, the Rays have figured it out, like, low market. The Guardians have figured it out, low market. The Brewers, who I'm kind of upset with right now, but they can figure it out, low market. You don't have to have a gazillion dollars to be a good baseball team to win the World Series. You probably do, but they're not even close to competitive. And it, it's got to be frustrating there because Brian Reynolds is their best player, best outfielder since McCutcheon. And like last year, 27 homers, 62 RBIs, 807 OPS, 262 average. And he requested a trade. Uh, the Pirates said that it's not going to change their plans, but. This might be a money leverage thing, but in my opinion, I listed some teams that could uh can use Brian Reynolds services. I listed the Mets, Yankees, Braves, Guardians, Giants, Dodgers, and Orioles. I had the Giants and Dodgers kind of the same. I think they're tied because I don't really think the Dodgers would do that. And also the Giants, it depends on Aaron Judge. The Mets might lose Brandon Nimmo. And if they do, I'm just still looking here to see if there's any moves going on. But, uh, yeah, like Vince Velasco was just signed with the Pirates. Uh, St. Louis Cardinals remain among favorites for the Cardinals. So that would be a – oh, wait, no. The St. Louis Cardinals remain favorites for Wilson Contreras. My apologies for that. So we might have news as we're on a live podcast, which would be really cool. And but back to Brian Reynolds. Like the Mets might lose Nimmo. They, they have to replace that. The Yankees might lose Judge. They have to replace that. The Braves need a left fielder. And I think they would make a lot of sense and it would really fill out their team. And I would not want that to happen, but like, why not? I mean, I don't think they're going to sign Swanson, but that has nothing to do with Brian Reynolds. Um, So maybe you could put a package together for him. And then the three, the three teams, I'm not, I'm going to take out the Dodgers. I don't think they're going to get him, but the guardians, giants and Orioles, I think in, if I had to rank the order of how like, Likely, these teams would be to get him. I would go Orioles, Guardians, Giants. Orioles, he's from Baltimore. They need another outfielder (laughs) unless they sign one in free agency. And they're on that cusp. They're on that cusp of being a playoff team and getting over that hump and being so much better than the Red Sox rather than just a little bit better than the Red Sox and catching up to the Yankees, Rays, and Blue Jays. They also have a loaded farm system. It's not going to take a top level prospect to get Brian Reynolds. And if you have a deep farm system, why not make the move? Like Gunnar Henderson's coming up. Colton Kowser is coming up. Like these guys, it's not unfeasible for the, the Orioles to do this. They have a ton of, like, like I keep saying, they have a ton of prospects. Let me look right now. Colton Kowser, like how old is he? He's in the Orioles organization. He was the fifth overall pick. Like Miley, this is Miley stats. He had 278 last year. He's 21 years old, 22 years old. And he's a center fielder. So 
that would be my only pushback is that he's coming up soon. But at the same time is you don't want to rely on prospects rather than established big leaguers. And also Cedric Mullins is a question mark for the future. We don't know how long he's going to be there, but you get Brian Reynolds. I think he's got a, he's got, he definitely has a team friendly contract. You know, you, you can, and you can get him for not that expensive because he's not like a marquee guy, but he's one of, he'd be one of the better left fielders in baseball. Uh, moving on, I would say the Guardians. Miles Straw can't hit. He needs to be a defensive center fielder. Like the Orioles, they have a good farm system. You can package something and throw him in center field every day or even left field and just mix and match with those outfielders like Oscar Gonzalez and Josh Naylor if he's playing the outfield for some reason. And another team that just like they need a bat. Like they have, like last year was a nice run, but like Ramirez, Jimenez, Josh Naylor. Oscar Gonzalez. Those are probably their top four hitters, I would say. Steven Kwan, too. Like, they have a decent lineup, but you add Thump like that in the middle, it makes things completely different. I know they're also in on Josh Bell, which would be a perfect fit for them. And, you know, why not pull the trigger? Why not go for it? Like, you draft well. You get good international signing bonus, guys. You seem to have a really good farm system all the time. So retooling that farm system won't be hard for you. So might as well go get the guy the, the, the star left fielder or the, an all-star player. And then the Giants, this is more of if they don't get Judge, like a consolation prize. I don't see this happening, um, but I, I just wanted to put another team. Same with the Dodgers. I was just thinking they're losing Cody Bellinger. They got to sign someone. So why not trade for Brian Reynolds? But it seems to be like they wouldn't part from like their prospects, they would just play these guys like the Edwin Rioses of the world who I know is gone now, but, or any of these guys, they don't really, besides that Turner Scherzer deal, like Lux came up, you know, and maybe Verdugo was the, the closest thing, but he's an average ball player at best. So I don't think a player like Brian Reynolds would be on the radar of a team like the Dodgers. I think they would want to go big and get Brandon Nimmo first, but Brian Reynolds, if I'd, I'd request a trade from the Pirates too. So um, we'll see how that shakes out and or even get traded at all. Okay, I just wanted to hit on a couple of like mid-level signings. Uh, I'm actually back. I, I recorded this at 2.15, but uh, it is now 11.05 p.m. But we had a ton of movement today after I clicked end. So I, I have two pitching signings and three mid-level, I, in my opinion, mid-level, mid-level offensive signings that I want to go through real quick. We're going to start with the pitching. Um, Andrew Heaney signed with the Rangers for two years, $25 million with an opt-out. Um, after DeGrom, they didn't really need to pay big money for like a like a Carlos Rodon. So you get this mid-level guy. You also put him with Martin Perez, John Gray still in this rotation, Jake Odorizzi. So now you have a formidable staff that's anchored by an ace, Rather than last year having just four or five three starters at best, like I'm not saying Andrew Heaney's a, a world beater, I would put him like I don't think he's as good as last year with the Dodgers, but I don't think he's as bad as he was with the Yankees. I think he's a little better than he was with the Angels because I think he might have found something with the Dodgers. Um, like I think he like had the highest K percentage in the league or something like that, or like top five, which is crazy because he's Andrew Heaney, but. Yeah, I don't hate this signing at all by the Rangers. I think that you know, just adding pitching depth is never that bad. I know there was a couple teams in on him, and he was in that group with like Jameson Tyone, Kodai Senga, Chris Bassett, and Taiwan Walker, who is now signed. He's the next guy. The Philadelphia Phillies signed him, four years, seventy-two million. Uh, wow, that's a seems like a pricey amount for Taiwan Walker, who is probably going to be their, I would say, four starter, because I think Wheeler and Nola are obviously one, two, and I think Ranger Suarez is better than Walker. Walker, as experienced as a Met fan over the last two years, has had great starts to the year and has completely like fallen apart in the second half, more in 2021 than 2022. But he's given up 31 homers in the second half combined in the last two years with a 5 5 9 ERA, which is not good, especially when. A team like the Phillies, who now has World Series aspirations, signing Trey Turner. Now they add Walker to their rotation. They also signed Matt Strom, a lefty reliever. And I think that like Walker's going to be in the same situation with the Phillies that he was with the Mets. Like The Mets last year had DeGrom, Scherzer, Bassett, 
Walker, even like Carrasco might have been in front of him. It's the same scenario here. He's the four starter. And I don't know how he's going to play in that ballpark, to be honest. His per, his um, projection stats, like his uh, expected stats, aren't the greatest. He does give up hard contact a lot. But if he can keep the ball on the ground, then he'll be okay, even with spotty Phillies defense. But I also think that like a ground ball is a ground ball. Like They're going to make routine plays. But if he if he starts giving up fly balls at an inconsistent rate like he has done in the second half, it's going to get bad really fast, and it might look like a really bad signing. But, you know, he, he he's earned this contract. Like, I know he had Tommy John. He signed with the Mets it, with this idea, like a prove-it deal. He gave two-year deal. He pitched well. Like, overall, it was a good job that he did with the Mets. But I don't know. This could be a little risky if I'm the Phillies, but – I, I like I like them being aggressive. I like them going to get another starter and not just settling for Trey Turner and living with the one two punch plus Ranger. Um, besides that, I don't really have much to say. I saw a lot of Met fans like mixed feelings with Walker. I liked him on the Mets, but I I didn't think we were getting him back. And good on him, you know. Congratulations, got paid. Can never fault a man for wanting to get paid. And four years, seventy two million. Also proves, I think it proves the Mets right for not giving him the qualifying offer because that's less year, that's less per year than what a qualifying offer would have been. So, I mean, obviously, hindsight 2020, they would have gotten a draft pick, but it shows that they knew his value wasn't that high. So don't risk that offer and have yourself in a little bit of not not cap, not like cap problems, but like closer to the CBT than you have to be, especially when you knew you weren't getting him back anyway unless he thought that was like a, a feasible deal, which obviously not. So congrats to Tyron Walker and Andrew Heaney on their contracts. And for now, I think the pitching is pretty thin when it comes to like signings, but I'm sure we'll have more this week. The three mid-level guys I wanted to talk about, in my opinion, I have Josh Bell, Cody Bellinger, and Mitch Hanniger. Yes, the Giants signed a right fielder, Mitch Hanniger. I'll get to him last, but Josh Bell happened literally as soon as I uh, stopped the first recording, but Cleveland Guardians, two years, $33 million, with an opt-out after one year. Bell is confusing to me because he was really good with the Nationals, really bad with the Padres. For a big guy, he only hit 17 home runs, which that is not concerning, but it's the, – the Cleveland needed thump, obviously. They obviously lacked that last year, but I don't know if Josh Bell is – a power bat like just because he's big and strong and tall like he doesn't hit like a power hitter like 17 home runs is not a slugger at all especially nowadays so i don't know if they're banking on him something clicking or just adding another bat to the lineup because he is a quality bat still i just don't know if it's what people think it's going to be for them i think people expect him to hit 30 homers which I think he's done once, to be honest. And last year, like I said, 17 homers, really struggled with the Padres. And it's been a couple of years now that he's played well in the first half and not the second half. Like I remember a couple of years ago with the Pirates, he did that. So is that a trend? I don't know. I also think with the shift going away, he hits a lot of ground balls. He's going to get more base hits, which is not the name of the game nowadays. But if it's his strength, then use it, you know? For a six, I don't know how big he is, but he's a big dude. That shouldn't be your strength, but it's also that's that's the Cleveland strength is singles and like not. I don't, I don't want to say like slap hitters, but they don't they don't have that much power, and that's why I don't really understand this signing as much. But I do understand like wanting to add another bat to your lineup. So that that it's a good good deal for me, for Guardians. Uh, Cody Bellinger, uh. If he is the 2019 or 2018 Cody Bellinger, this is the steal of the century. But that's that's the problem, is that we don't know. Cody Bellinger signs with the Cubs, one year, $17.5 million. Um, I don't know. I don't know how to feel about this. I, I mean, obviously, like for the Cubs, it's kind of low risk. But at the same time, then now they have an outfield of him, Suzuki, and Hap, who I failed to mention a couple times when talking about the Cubs, and I apologize. He's probably their best player. And Bellinger, like I said, if you get him anywhere close to what he was in his MVP season, you, you have an absolute steal. Like if he hits 240 with 30 homers or 25 homers 
and plays the defense he knows how to play, then that that's a steal. Like that that's a probably a three three four win player with his defensive value. And he I, there was like rumors, not rumors, but this agent and I th- believe he said that he had multi year deals on the table, but he didn't want to take them because he wanted to have a prove it year. And good on you, like his value it, it can't be lower right now. He's arguably arguably the last couple of years the worst hitter in baseball. And that's like saying something with some of the guys that play offense and swing the bat in the MLB. But um, I I think a change of scenery might help. Maybe I don't know about the Cubs. I I knew they were in contact with him. I wasn't sure if he was going to go there. I know the Mets were too, and it's gonna making me a little nervous that the center field market's kind of thin outside of Brandon Nimmo, and he might not be coming back. But overall, like I don't really have much to say about Cody Bellinger because it's a one year deal to prove a deal, and he's shown us his. He is the true peak and valley. He's shown us as good as you could possibly be, like rivaling ri- rivaling Trout as the best player in baseball. And to get non-tendered, like literally like three years apart. Like it wasn't like he's like in his late 30s. You see that like with Justin Upton that happened at, at the end of his career. This guy's like, I think like 26, 27. Like it's, I don't really know how to, it's not precedented because he's not injured. He's not older. Like, it's unprecedented to have a drop off this bad. Like, even Christian Yelich is still quality hitter, gets on base a lot, like 750 OPS. Anthony Rendon, too, like 740, 750 OPS. But this guy is, I don't know how you could fall off a cliff that badly, but we'll, we'll see if he can turn it around with the Cubs. And finally, like, the right fielder that the San Francisco Giants signed was Mitch Hanniger. Before I get into Mitch Hanniger, the one thing I will say is this does not take them out of the Aaron Judge sweepstakes. Jeff Passan said it. I kind of knew it as soon as I saw the deal. Their goal before this offseason was to get both of these guys, was to get Hanniger and Judge. Three years, $43.5 million, And like I said, not out on Judge. And I think that's the most important thing here. I think he, this guy fits anywhere, a, a power bat in right field or left field. He'll probably be with the Giants if the... the um, the Giants sign Aaron Judge, or as John Heyman said, Arson Judge, which t- tough, uh, tough, tough, correct, autocorrect, especially that he wasn't signing. But you know, sometimes you got to be careful when you want to be first in journalism and make sure you have some confirmation. Uh, but you know, he's not the only one that does that, so I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna bash him like a lot of people do. But th- this is a good signing anyway, even with it, if they don't get Judge, I do think it takes them out of the Nimmo sweepstakes. Um, unless they don't land um, Aaron Judge, but I also think that their goal is to get both of them. And this, it was probably Judge and then Hanniger or Nimmo. So I think that's what they want to do. But besides that, this guy's a quality hitter. I know he missed a lot of time last year, but he's proven he could be a, a five. He's like the prototypical five hitter, and the Giants are in dire need of just any consistent bat outside of. Like I don't, Mike Yastrzemski even had a bad year. Brandon Crawford just decent, but Luis Gonzalez is like oh all right. Lamont Wade's all right. JD Davis is all right. Like they don't have a consistent hitter in their lineup. He could be that guy. Okay, I'm gonna end this on a a couple of like small moves that happened. Um, I'm gonna just throw out Tommy Canley back to the Yankees two years, eleven and a half million. Also, Brian Cashman got an extension four years. That I know that was the news the Yankees fans were looking for. Uh, I feel bad for Yankee fans right now. I don't know what's going on with Aaron Judge. Also, if um, if Aaron Judge signs like tomorrow and this podcast is already out, I'm going to do an emergency podcast. I was going to do it for the Grom, but I figured I can't do that because then like Turner and Verlander signed. So like, why not just wait a couple of days? So I think Judge will be the only guy I'll do an emergency podcast for. But even then, I'm not sure. I might just do another one. On Saturday, let me know in the comments below if you want one once a week or twice a week. I would appreciate the viewers and how you want to consume this pod- this this podcast and this content. And I appreciate everyone that listens. So yeah, Tommy Canley, two and two years, eleven and a half million, low risk deal for the Yankees. Just add to the bullpen. Matt Blake, work your magic. Um, Zach Eflin of the Rays, three years, forty million, the biggest AAV in a Rays contract ever, which is not surprising but also insane that Zach Eflin got it, even though Wander Franco signed a like a 
large deal, even though it's like not a high AAV at all. Zach Elfin of the Rays. Last week I talked about Mike Clevenger and how the White Sox are just not going to do anything for him when it comes to uh, maximizing his ability. That is the complete opposite with, with Zach Eflin and the Rays. I think he found something with the Phillies. I saw he had like a knee issue a couple years ago when he could finally get full extension. With a, we got powerful stuff. Now he's in the Rays organization who are going to make him spin the ball, who are going to make him move the ball with that 97-mile-an-hour fastball. And I think it's just a perfect fit. He screams like a 2-7 ERA for the Rays as like their three starter. And yeah, uh, they're just going to work their magic with this guy and make him work. <clears throat> Excuse me. And that's why probably they gave him their biggest AAV ever. They saw the potential. They saw they saw the projections like I keep talking about. They saw that this guy can be a 2-3 starter um, at best. Probably more of a 4, but with the Rays, you never know. The Cole Wong trade really pissed me off. Um, the for for both teams, to be honest, because from the Cole Wong got traded for Jesse Waker and Abraham Toro. I don't really care what the Brewers got back, to be honest. But what bothers me with the Brewers is it's almost like it's not their fault, but at the same time, it is. Why are you selling? You know, like you have. I know Yelch is under a big time contract, but besides that, not no one really on your team is getting paid a ton of money. You refuse to pay Josh Hader, and he's back. He got back to himself with the Padres towards the end. You traded Hunter Renfro, and now you trade Colton Wong. And I'm not saying Colton Wong is the biggest deal, but he's better than Abraham Toro at second base or Jesse Winker coming off a really bad year. And like, are they going to trade Corbin Burns? I was going to do a, a segment today on Corbin Burns and possible teams, but there was so much that happened. So I, I want to wait, use that when something, when it's like a little drier of a podcast. Are they going to trade Corbin Burns and Brandon Woodruff? Like, are, are they going to trade, like, uh, what's his name? Mitchell, their, their pro- big time prospect, center fielder. Are they going to trade Rowdy Telez? Like, I don't get what they're doing. Like, you just made the playoffs a couple years ago. You've been it took like a bad run for you to miss the playoffs this year, and you've been super competitive the last couple years. Are they going to trade Adamas? Like I don't get it. I don't. They don't. It doesn't make any sense to me why they would do this. And if Corbin Burns is available, you best believe his market is going to be insane. Like I'm talking twenty teams in on that guy, and I hope the Mets would be one of them. But that that bothered me. Like, why are you? Unless you're banking on Jesse Winker becoming 2019 Jesse Winker or 2021 Jesse Winker, which I don't know what he, I don't know what he is, Jesse Winker. He's had good years. He's had bad years. His power went completely away. Um, yeah. So, I, and like you already have that in Christian Yelich. I mean, Christian Yelich is better than Jesse Winker, but now your outfield has no power because you traded Renfro for Winker and Yelich, who combined, I think, had the same amount of home runs. And that that's I don't I don't get it. And then the Mariners bother me more because the Brewers will I don't know what I don't know what the identity of the Brewers are. The Mariners had a chance to get a superstar shortstop. I'm pretty sure I, I predicted Dansby to go to them, but I don't think that's gonna happen anymore. A superstar shortstop. Correa, Trey Turner, even though he didn't want to be on the West Coast. Xander Bogarts is still out there. Instead, we're going to trade for Colton Wong and logjam ourselves up the middle. Now you have a middle infield of Colton Wong and Jesse Winker. Not Jesse Winker. Colton Wong and J.P. Crawford. I don't get it. I understood trading Winker because Teoscar Hernandez is going to be out there now. But you, you just hamstrung yourself so much for at least one more year. And I don't, I don't get it. Like... Like I talked about the Phillies bursting through that window. You know why? Because they didn't pick up Gene Segura's option and they went out and signed Trey Turner. Like, why Why not? Like, I don't get it. You don't really... Julio Rodriguez got that gigantic deal, but it's going to be team-friendly in five years the way these contracts are going. Castillo got paid. Why not pay a shortstop? It's not like Seattle is hurting for money. They're a pretty... Like, they've become a pretty robust market, especially with the Seahawks, which I don't think that has any correlation, but bear with me. I don't get 
doing this. Like it doesn't make any sense to me because Colin Wong is a very solid player, good enough to start every day. JP Crawford, kind of the same thing. Although I'm not as high in him as some people are. You also have Suarez at third and France at first. So you are locked in on the infield now. It's not like one of those guys are utility guys, or they view them at least that way. Why, why not? Like, why not go for it? You're not catching the Astros with Colton Wong. I'm sorry, you're not. And J.P. Crawford, as your starting shortstop, you are definitely not catching the Astros. I don't care if they lose Verland or maybe if they lose both of them. But no matter what, what they do besides get a star shortstop, you're not catching the Astros. And that's the name of the game, right? In baseball, you got to win the division. Give yourself a shot. And I don't know. That really bothered me just because you settled. You settled for Colton Wong rather than going to get Trey Turner or Xander Bogarts. And if you don't view Xander Bogarts as a shortstop in a couple of years, then play him at second instead of Colton Wong. Like, and keep Crawford at short. No matter what, though, it, I saw they were also in on Gleyber Torres. It's like they were like purposely not wanting to get one, and I don't get it. Anyway, I think that's it. Uh, I saw we got some we got some Cubs news too. They might sign Swanson and Bogarts, but I'll let that play out. Um, appreciate you guys listening. Uh, we had a lot of stuff to talk about today, and I'm very excited to be keep doing this with you guys. I think I picked the perfect time to start this podcast and tell your friends, tell your enemies, tell your acquaintances, tell your family. I don't care who you tell, but. If you like baseball, this is the place to be. This is the RBI podcast, Richie's Baseball Index. And like I keep saying, just subscribe, leave a rating on Apple and Spotify, leave a comment, follow me on Instagram, DM me questions you have. I can maybe put them on the podcast if I get enough. But uh, besides that, that's all I got. I appreciate you guys listening so much and peace out.